Uh, thanks, Chrissy, and uh, thanks, Jackson, and the RAU team for having us back again. So, uh, my name is Michael Scannerbury. I'm a resources analyst at, at Euros Hartleys, and um, yeah, it's a bit of a sensationalist headline, so I have to apologise for that straight off the bat. Um, I see the media does it a fair bit these days, uh, kind of grabbing grabbing attention. So I thought I'd just try and do the same and fill up the room with the crowd. So uh, it seemed to have worked quite well. So, so last year I went with the title Energy Transition Mining Supercycle. So I believe that is, um, and we believe at Euros Hartleys, that is currently playing out as we speak. And we're probably just in the, in the foothills of the, uh, of the supercycle super that the energy transition is, is kind of uh, playing out. You know, a, a decade of underinvestment in the resources sector, um, along with the metals required uh, to actually uh, feed into this energy transition, is, is we believe is only just, uh, just kicking off. And what people often forget and what this uh, presentation is about is just the incentive pricing required to increase metal demand, uh, sorry, to, to feed into that increase to metal demand, isn't just profitable uh, for, for the miners currently in the industry, but to incentivise new fresh capital to increase supply for these metals. So that's what we'll be looking to tackle from, uh, a bit of a di different angle in this, uh, in this presentation. We'll see if we, there we go. I um, thought it wouldn't be the same coming over to Sydney without having a crack at the GST. So I was over in Sydney just a couple of weeks ago and another sensationalist headline saying the, uh, the New South Wales is to lose its AAA credit rating due to the GST shakedown. And it really just, you know, just got me thinking of, of what really feeds into the, uh, into the GST and how it's actually allocated. Um, so remember the GST is allocated on, on a state's ability to raise revenue with mining royalties, land values, property sales, the main driver, and shifts in annual changes in distribution. Remember, uh, GS, uh, WA has been previously dudded in the GST with its uh, allocation previously forecast to head down to 16 cents in the dollar for every dollar of GST raised in, in Western Australia. Uh, however, the, uh, the floor has now been put at, uh, at 75 cents. So you could probably just think of a, you know, a hypothetical situation um, with, with the GST, of a potential you know, a hypothetical Australian state that ties up their resource projects in green and red tape, uh, encourages coal-fired power stations to close down before uh, suitable base load power is there to, 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 to replace that, uh, making the, uh, the, the power source of that state more reliable on, on gas. Uh, and then tying up grass in, gas uh, resources in more green and red tape, and then blaming those gas uh, suppliers for, for, you know, for not releasing or, or supplying the gas at the right price and putting price caps on them. You know, all hypothetical kind of uh, scenarios here. You know, a state uh, in, West, in, in, in Australia wouldn't be, uh, surely wouldn't be that crazy. And even, even banning onshore oil and gas exploration, you only have to look to the south for that. But um, yeah, I just thought it would just be an, you know, an interesting kind of take on the, uh, on the GSD. And I thought you know, it would be pretty suitable just to, to flick across to see what, um, see what Western Australia does with their resources industry. And we're just looking at you know, just a few random examples in Western Australia over the time. You know, we had the, the lithium market taking off in, in recent years. You have Pilgangora and Altura, which is now under the house of, of, of Pilbara Minerals. Um, you know, a study into first production, creating jobs, royalties and paying GST. Uh, you had the Roy Hill Hancock project, um, you know, that's ramped up to over 60 million tonnes per annum now, a $10 billion Australian uh, uh, cost for that project. The Wheatstone project, so people might not be familiar with this, but on the, uh, on the west coast we export LNG as opposed to building, building import terminals, so it's, a, uh, it's kind of a crazy concept, but generates really, really good revenue for the, uh, for the state. And then just I thought I'd just cherry pick one for, for New South Wales. Um, McPhillum is, you know, that was acquired back in 2012. I was just coming out of, uh, coming out of, out of high school there. Uh, the asset purchased, they've drilled it out. They put out a PFS. Uh, I believe they were forecasting approvals in 2017 and first production in 2018. And here we are today, still awaiting approvals. Who would have thought? Anyway, cracking on. Um, more sensationalist headlines. Um, you know, I've, Cherry picked a few of these out of the last mining down, uh, downturn, you know, 2014 through 2016. It's kind of a dire state across uh, across the industry. You know, we had Glencore was going to go broke. They were um, they were paying Dell's debt concerns. Coal prices were in the in the doldrums. Iron ore was in the doldrums. 50,000 jobs. You know, will iron ore ever recover? China's blowing up, and then you know everything recovered and everything's hunky dory now. But uh, looking back. You know, it was it's pretty dire. But one just caught my eye recently. It was just that um, just around the the resources exports for energy uh, in Australia to slump by 100 billion dollars by the end of the decade to 300 billion dollars, and that kind of just grabbed my attention. Just more of these kind of head, sensationalist kind of headlines. 
what does that what does that actually look like? That's the that's the chart there, and who's actually saying it? It's, it's the chief economist, um, uh, chief Australian economist, sorry, uh, for the federal government. So you, you you think that you know reading that the uh, the mining industries you know it's all over it's heading back. What, what does that actually assume in those numbers to have that have the um, the revenue falling by 100 billion dollars? You know first of all you've got iron ore heading to um, heading to 75 dollars from 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 its current price of 110. Uh, you know, if I had a dollar for every time I heard someone say that iron ore was going to be heading back to $75 a ton uh, in the last 10 years, I'd be, a, I'd be a very rich man. They're forecasting gold pulling back to under US $2,000 an ounce. It's currently at $2,300. You've got thermal coal heading down to $100 or under $100 a ton by the end of the decade. It's currently trading at $150. Uh, coking coal is going below $200 a ton. It's currently at $250. Um, the chief economist must have been drinking Twiggy's Kool-Aid on, on green steel there for that one. Um, you've got copper staying at $9,300 a tonne, um, and just flat through to the end of the decade. No incentive pricing, but don't worry, we'll just increase uh, copper supply by 30%. You know, just truly crazy uh, demands for, for copper, but there's no forecast for, um, um, for, for incentive pricing to bring on that new supply. So that kind of got me thinking, you know, that's just the key for chief economist of, um, of Australia there with those kind of pricing, but what's the rest of the market saying? Uh, in terms of con you know, consensus forecasts. So I thought it'd just be you know, worth touching on um, you know, consensus price forecasts. And you're probably thinking, you know, it's not really that exciting. A whole bunch of uh, boffins sitting in a room coming up with commodity pro forecasts out for 10 years. Uh, but it actually is very, very important. You know, when we look at uh, consensus forecasts, we're talking about up to 40 uh, analysts and economists' predictions, largely bulge brackets. So you think of Macquarie, Bank of America, JP Morgan, UBS, Goldman Sachs, you get the idea. They all put out, publish their data, and then the consensus forecast obviously is the, um, is, is the average of those. And why does it matter? Because these price assumptions feed into analyst models, pricing forecasts, um, that, you know, that, like myself, that would uh, feed into their valuations, um, earnings forecasts, and it can be a key driver of equities in the market. And if you think that that doesn't really matter, uh, you can look at Liontown, for example. Look at their debt package that got pulled recently by the banks. That was just down to, content, down to uh, forecasting pricing of lithium, staying lower for longer. There was a downgrade in, the, in, in their pricing forecast. They got their debt package pulled and look at, look at the, the share price reaction. So these, these consensus forecasts really are uh, extremely important. So I thought, yeah, we were worth uh, kicking off with, with copper. And um, just to explain the chart, so we're running through a few of these. So you're looking at that, that gold line there, that's the, uh, that's the spot copper price. And those dotted lines where it intercepts the, uh, the spot copper price going forward, that's the consensus from that particular, particular year. So as you can see, you can, uh, from about 2011 going forward, yeah, that was the post-GFC uh, China stimulus. Uh, and then for about you know, six or seven years, yeah, consistent overcalling of the uh, of the copper price as that overcapacity in the copper uh, copper market was really really worked through, um, and then you, we're almost in the opposite scenario um, as as we speak right now. So, um, you know, you've got forecasts out there for how much money needs to be spent in the copper space to increase supply to to, to feed into this energy transition. However, I just don't believe um, you know you just get this increased um, uh, spending in, in of capital without incentive pricing. So you know you, you can see forecasts out there. Uh, there's, there's a number of them, uh, not the consensus forecast, but just one-off uh, people out in the market calling for fifteen thousand dollars a ton. You know that's the kind of incentive pricing required to draw in fresh capital from outside the resource sector to to expand uh, expand supply. And then another way to look at it, uh, BHP's bid, recent bid for, for Anglo-American only you know, last week, the bid was, um, what I found was quite interesting, was that, that there was a 19% premium over the median net asset value of Anglo-American from, from the analyst community. So you look at that, you go, okay, that's, that's, that's quite interesting. Uh, wh wh why, be, why are BHP paying a premium to what the analysts are saying it's worth? You know, the only read-through on that, or a read-through, would be that they're assuming a higher copper price assumption in their models. And you know, I'm not one to, um, to give BHP credit, but you'd hope the second largest copper producer on the planet would know a thing or two about the copper price going forward. Uh, I thought I'd just chuck in a little bonus chart, just seeing it's getting a fair bit of, uh, of attention recently. So it's just the copper, um, copper concentrate uh, TCRCs versus the actual copper price. So, so first of all, TCRCs are the treatment refining costs, and I've inverted that on the, uh, on the right-hand side. So if you squint your eyes, you can kind of see an inverse relationship there, or it's correlated on that chart, given that it's, um, given that it's inverted. So you know, it, it just talks to the tightness in the copper market that we're seeing at the moment. Uh, as as you know, we've had Anglo-American downgrade their copper supply. Um, you've had 
you know, uh, Cobre um, first quantum's mine in, uh, in Panama, uh, gone to care and maintenance due to civil unrest. Uh, that's taken copper concentrate out of the market and created a tight, tight market. So we're even hearing of you know, Chinese copper smelters um, charging a negative uh, TCRC. I've never heard of that. That's just to, uh, to ensure that the smelter stays online. So you know, it points to a very, very tight market in the, uh, in, in the copper concentrate market and uh, it, points to, it bodes very well for the, uh, for the copper price going forward. Uh, iron ore, you couldn't really go, go past uh, iron ore just given how, how meaningful it is to, to Western Australia. So it basically drives the Western Australian economy as I'm sure everyone would be aware. Um, but it also provides the federal government's um, handy uh, federal government surpluses and anyone that says that it doesn't provide the surplus is either a politician or a liar or both. Um, so you know you can look at it and it's kind of a classic, um, you know back to, back to 2015 you, you're working through that um, and you basically work through that overcapacity that was built out uh, during the, the, the China stimulus. Uh, but essentially since then they've undercalled the, uh, the iron ore price which I touched on before. You know, to be fair, in 2019 you had the, the Brazilian um, uh, tailings dam disaster, so that took a fair chunk of tons out of the market. So you can you can kind of explain that that spike, and then you had the uh, the COVID the COVID reopening um, you know spike in, in 2020 as well. So it's it's quite amazing. You know, it's consistently people calling for uh, you know for, for for the iron ore price to to fall. Um, but you know, you look, look at the market now, and it actually is quite hard to come out with a bullish, um, bullish outlook for iron ore. You've got, you know, you've got the, the Pilbara Killer Simandu coming online early next year. Um, you know, that, that's looking to go to 80 million tonnes, then up to 150 million tonnes, roughly 4% of global, um, global iron ore uh, demand to come online there. Then you've even got, you know, Onslow iron ore. Um, so that's, that's going to be ramping up. That should be first ore in, in June, and then they'll be ramping up to 60 million tonnes and beyond. So that's a mineral resources project out of Onslow. You know, that's a true first real growth that we've seen in the iron ore market, um, basically since the, the large capex projects in the, in the Pilbara uh, have taken off. So and one thing on Simandu, on you, know, you know, if you want to take a slightly bullish outlook, it's a bit grim, but, uh, you know, in Gabon only recently, had a trail derailment, so it just kind of highlights the uh, the difficulties of operating in, in Africa and the, and the concerns around around supply um, in, in Africa and the difficulties of operating there as well. I uh, couldn't go past thermal coal, so you know if you can't see the the date there, um, it's the 11th of December 2020. So you know they absolutely nailed the uh, nailed the bottom. Of the uh, of the coal price, which I'm sure you'll see soon, but uh, I couldn't help but chuck it on a chart. So, um, so making coal history, and they absolutely nailed it. It's fifty dollars a ton at the time that they called that, um, and then you know you had the COVID reopening, thermal coal prices absolutely took off. So I'm so I'm using the high quality Newcastle um, six thousand calories a, a kilogram there for the uh, for for the coal price, and you hear a lot of people talking about. Um, you know, energy prices, it's all Russia's fault. They've invaded Ukraine. Uh, that's why your energy prices are high. Again, probably a politician uh, telling you that. However, you know, when you take a look back, the, the coal price was well over $150 a ton, and that's as well before, um, that was over 2021, and that was well before the, the Russian invasion um, into, into Ukraine. And we're still trading that here, but yet they've still got forecasts going. Um, you know, still going below $100 a ton, despite the price um, being, being you know, right up there. So what you know, people don't really look at and what's kind of feeding into that negative outlook, of course, you've got, you know, you've got coal-fired power stations getting closed down. I see the, the earring uh, plant here in New South Wales is, is forecast to close. Um, you know, the Western nations around the world are all closing their, uh, their coal-fired power stations. However, the outlook actually looks quite strong if you, if you actually just open your eyes and you look to the rest of the world. Um, who, who's buying this coal? Uh, so I thought I'd just you know, show a bit of a chart here. That's the, if you just look at the, the, uh, the black bars there, that's the additional Chinese um, coal-fired capacity added to the market. So, and the red line there is the global net change in coal-fired ca power capacity. You know, people call coal, coal a, um, you know, a sunset industry. Uh, I'm not sure about you, that doesn't look that bearish to me. So they've added 50 gigawatts of, uh, or just under, you know, of, of coal-fired pa power capacity last year alone in China. So, you know, just for some context, Australia has about 25 gigawatts. So they added twice Australia's uh, coal-fired power generation in one year. Um, you've got, you know, European Union, they've got uh, roughly just over 200 gigawatts of power. China added that in the last four years. So 
I'm not sure about everyone else, but that doesn't look that bearish. And I don't know anyone that's, uh, that's trying to bring on a large thermal coal mine, so the, the supply looks quite constrained. So yeah, it's looking pretty, uh, pretty bullish outlook for, for, uh, for thermal coal, if I'm honest. Um, and then, yeah, we couldn't go past gold. So gold, not going to pretend like I've got a crystal ball and it's not, it has a, um, um, you know, a real supply and demand kind of thematic to it. But it's, um, you know, it's an interesting one. You, know, you hear a lot of people talk to, to real rates and the, and the uh, inverse correlation with real, real US interest rates versus the gold price. However, that, that, that correlation, you know, it's worked for a good 10 years. It's, it's worked until it doesn't work. It recently broke down. The gold price is, uh, is absolutely kicking off. And I think, you know, from, from my point of view, I'd, uh, I think every diversified portfolio should have a decent chunk in, uh, in, either, in either physical gold or in the producers. You know, you look at something like this and you, you'd, um, it's basically essentially competing with the US dollar in, in my view. You know, not calling for an end to the US dollar, um, but if you're a, an Eastern nation or someone that isn't aligned to either, you know, the US or with, um, with the Eastern in China or Russia, I think you'd be crazy not to have your foreign reserves um, you know, at least partially, partially uh, invested in, in, in gold. So, you know, I think you just got to look at the, uh, the move towards a multipolar world, away from the unipolar world of, uh, of, uh, of the US, and it looks extremely bullish. And if you want to see a bullish chart of the gold price, which I probably should have put in, but have a look at the, uh, the, the gold price in yen. It's truly exceptional. Uh, uranium. So I think this one's worth touching on. Um, you've got to hand it to the, uh, the bulls of uranium that have been mocked for, for well over a decade. Um, you know, always calling for a, for a bull market in, in uranium. However, you know, it's finally with us and we're here. So, you, you know, you had the Fukushima disaster in, uh, in, in 2011 and then a continual call for, for prices to go higher for longer. Um, however, it just didn't, didn't have, uh, just basically just didn't happen. Uh, and you had, yeah, you know, numerous um, uh, nuclear power stations closing down. Um, and now, you know, you've got, you got, you got uh, almost nuclear power stations announced uh, every day of the week. You know, Australia is even, um, you know, we'll, we'll be buying our own nuclear power stations just in, in the form of submarines, and I'm sure we'll be getting nuclear power shortly, shortly before that, probably, um, with the change out in government, I would have thought. Uh, and then it's probably just worth noting that in WA we're still not allowed to mine it, um, but again, probably a change in government would solve that one as well, which is only a matter of time, in my view. Uh, lithium, this is, this is kind of the, the crux of it, really. Um, so it's so what we're looking at here, you know, the overcapacity from the, from the last um, uh, pricing high, you know, it was ticking off down, and no one really saw it coming. They're calling for low prices to continue going forward. Bang, the, the you know, um, demand outseated um, uh, supply, it's absolutely taken off. Top of the market, what do they do? Everyone consensus calls. Everyone's like, yep, it's, it's going to be even going higher, and it's going to stay higher for longer. What happened? Did the complete opposite. Got absolutely crunched, and now we're on the, we're on the back end of it. People are calling for lower prices for longer. So again, you know, consensus forecasts are reactive and not proactive. So that's basically the point there. Forecasts are reactive and not really proactive. Higher prices lead to higher forecasts, as you saw there, and the analysts upgrade their earnings forecasts. Uh, incentive pricing is required for, uh, for, for higher for longer to, to, uh, to bring in that, bring that fresh capital to really, um, really you know, increase that supply. Um, and then you, know, you, you just have to, people say that it doesn't really matter, you have to just look back again to that Lion Town example and, and how, they, how they actually got their debt. You know, um, you know, increased supply is really there to, to support that energy transition, whether uh, whether people like it uh, like it or not. So I, I believe that you know it's not really in the consensus forecast, and I think that that really uh, lies the the opportunity to to invest in the resource sector. Um, and I was told I had to give my company a plug, otherwise I would lose my job. So. So Euros Hartleys, if you don't know, we're proudly a West Australian firm. Uh, we've got you know, just over 80, sorry, 60 uh, wealth advisors on, it, on our desk. We have uh, $3.5 billion of, of funds under management. And what we, what we really try and do is, is showcase and connect uh, high quality stories in the resource sector and industrials on, on, in Western Australia uh, to our institutional client base on the East Coast, but obviously our, our private wealth clients spread across Australia as well. And I thought I'd just quickly just tuck into a, you know, a classic case example and this is from, from last year, the IOU conference, um, and it was a real takeaway for, for us. So it was um, Tony Rivera uh, coming forward with his uh, Andover Lithium discovery. So just for some context, he was just drilling uh, his first few holes, uh, he had some scrappy intercepts, he puts this slide out, 100 million tonnes of resources. And the first thing that I thought to myself is bullshit. 
There's no way he's got 100 million tonnes sitting just outside Roeburn, uh, outcropping mineralisation all over it. A month later, he's putting out 100 metre intercepts of lithium oxide. Uh, we're buying tens of millions of dollars of stock uh, every single day for about a week straight, and the rest is really history. Uh, and absolutely took off. So if anyone's got a, uh, an Andover-style discovery, please come and find me and I'll, and I'll buy you a beer. Thanks for listening. Good evening, Michael.